Dr. James Magara from Uganda, one of our board members. He's a dentist by profession with many other cups that he holds. But let's receive um, Dr. James Magara to come and bring the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And uh, good to see you all. Um, I was telling Hudson, uh, the Kenya team has done an excellent job. Uh, Brother Wachir and your team. Uh, given the time for mobilization, we, I was not expecting very many people. <laughs> but I'm glad you're filling this hall. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So I have, uh, I'll be speaking in two uh, sessions. The first one is today. And I was looking for a title. I just got the title of what I wanted to share this morning. <laughs> I already had the content, but I wanted to show how to, how to put it. Um, and this morning we began our altar raising um, with something that I'll reemphasize today. And much of what I'm going to share today is probably not new to you. There may be one or two things that are new. I'm just praying the Lord will put fire on it. Um, tomorrow... I would want, let's just speak peace into the city in the name of Jesus. We speak peace into the city. We silence all the noise. In the name of Jesus, we silence the noise. We disperse the chaos in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right, so um, tomorrow I'll be doing a lot more <laughs> spiritual warfare in my preaching. Um, today I just pray the Lord will give enlightenment so that we can see. Um, the last four years God has been dealing with some things in my life, you know, some especially mental strongholds in a way that um, I didn't realize how deep this, some of these things were. Uh, but uh, tomorrow I think it will become a lot more clear. God is speaking to us about reigning as kings and priests. Um, it's said that the world, the whole world is now experiencing what's called fifth generation warfare. You can look, after, look, up, look it up later. Um, and if I remember correctly, generation one of warfare was on the land. People used to fight with bows and arrows and, you know, and uh, those kind of things. And a time came... When warfare moved, they, they went to the waters. So second generation warfare. About 100 years ago, third generation warfare began. And that was uh, in the air. When the airplanes were discovered and stuff like that. Uh, fourth generation, if I believe correctly, has been, if I remember correctly, has been something to do with the you know, internet and stuff like that. We are now in fifth generation warfare. And you know what that is? Psychological warfare. He who controls your thoughts controls. And that's why you see there is heavy investment in the media. And if you look back over the last two, three years, you see how much, now that I believe most of you have been, eyes have been opened, you see how much the media was used to propagate certain things about what happened around the world. The media was diet. You know, when the fear gripped the world, the news waves took over. It was a bit like Goliath. You know, Goliath was uh, already in fifth generation warfare. Because mm. Goliath would come in the morning, and it says morning and evening. For 40 days, there was morning news and evening news. And it was bad news. To a point that by the time Daniel, David appears on the scene, Goliath doesn't even have to say anything. He just appears and people are running. Now, many of us have been victims of that. And uh, the people behind it are very, very highly skilled. They know how to manipulate groups of people. So I, uh, this is important for us in the church because the enemy has also been, well, he's overworked himself in controlling the mindset of the church. And if we don't understand the counsel of God, we cannot, you're, you've lost the battle right there. You remember the tribes, the the 10 tribes, oh, 10 tribes, the 12 spies who went to the land. Yes. And remember how the enemy was able to cause a whole generation to miss his destiny without a single shot. Mm. 
There was not one arrow fired, nothing. It was just through the words and the minds of the ten spies. A whole generation lost. So we have to pay particular attention to what we believe and uh, re-examine some of the things that we believe. And I'll be challenging you a lot tomorrow, especially. But today, I'm just praying the Lord will bring clarity as we talk about the two councils. And uh, you remember that in the morning. I, I will not go too much into it because uh, this was already in my notes, by the way, in the morning when I was asked to raise the altar. There's the council of the nations. That was our theme four years ago. And uh, you know, we didn't understand at the time we chose that theme how much God was speaking through it. But as I said earlier, the council of the nations and the plans of the peoples, this happens in every generation. In our generation, it's much more uh, global. It's um, because of the way the world is interconnected. Uh, the people who represent the other side have been able to use all the technology and so on to, to unify the council around the world. <clears throat> but the great thing here is that the plans of the Lord stand forever. So when you put those two together, you know which one stands forever. That means the other one doesn't. And uh, his plan also expands. Uh, his uh, plans go to all generations. And then we looked at Psalm 2. <clears throat> Again, seeing that people's plot. So all this stuff about conspiracy theories, they are conspiracies. <laughs> From the days of David, they were there. Maybe just knowing what they were, but they were there, you know. Uh, they are, the kingdom of darkness has always conspired against the kingdom of God, and it gets human representatives uh, to carry out his conspiracies. And you see the kings of the earth set themselves, they determined, they take counsel together, so they meet and agree on certain things, you know. And uh, as I said earlier on, ultimately, it's against the Lord, and against anointed, against the counsel of the Lord, against the plan of the Lord. Um, and as we saw in the morning, um, God laughs. I mean, for me, that is the most encouraging thing when you see things that are crazy going on. God is laughing. And I say, God, I need to be near enough to you so that I can begin to laugh. <clears throat> because usually I'm not laughing. <laughs> well, when God begins to show you, it's, it's not a laughing matter. But God is not panicking. And that's that we need to be close enough to him uh, so that we can also speak. When he speaks, he speaks through us. Um, and God talks about setting his king on Zion. But then we also see that part of God's counsel, and I'm just going to slant this message a lot so that we see it. In this context, when the nations are raging, the peoples are imagining a vain thing. They want to take over this, take over that. What is God's plan? God's plan for the nations. He's telling the son, ask the nations. I want to give you the nations. And as we come as kings and priests, we need to understand that that is where God's heart is. Exactly where the enemy's heart is to try and deny God, the nations. Because of all the sort of things and structures the enemy is putting up. God is saying, in fact, the sign that the enemy is rising up so much to try and talk about the nations, just a sign that he's trying to push back what God has already purposed in his heart. And as sons and daughters of the king, this has to be very clear to us. Otherwise, we become far less than what we are supposed to be. Okay. Um, amen. Okay, those are brief comments there. Now, let's go back. And I'm going to go back to the very beginning. We're going to take a quick journey through the Bible. Um, <clears throat> what was God's counsel for the earth? What was God's counsel for the earth? As we go through this, I'd like to cover these themes. His intent, uh, kingdom for man on the earth. Uh, briefly on the kingdom lost. And then we'll look at the promise that was given. And then the kingdom restored and inaugurated. And uh, really the focus of what we are looking at now is how is what? What is God doing about the f bringing the fullness of what he has intended? His counsel stands for all generations. So from the generation of Adam, there are things he began to do which he has never, you know, taken leave from. He's been walking through the, through the ages, bringing them to pass. Amen. So let's go back to the beginning. <clears throat> now, in the beginning, we see a situation where the Godhead takes counsel together. They have a meeting. And what do they say? What was the, the resolution that came out of that meeting? We don't know all the details of the discussions, but they came up with the resolution. 
And uh, Moses, who the Lord inspired to write these words, was privileged to enter into this council, to know what the purpose was. Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and said to them, be fruitful. Now, just let me pause there. Do you realize how much of this is being attacked today? What was the counsel of God? What is the counsel? Do you realize how kings and, and uh, rulers have counseled to attack just that line? Okay. Last year, there was a big conference, United Nations, this year, year of education. Uh, people didn't understand what was being said. Now, all over the world, billions of dollars are going towards education. But you know what education? It's coming from way up there. The council of God, the council of the nations. It's right there. Male and female, he created them. That is under heavy contestation. Let's break off the bonds. We don't want that stuff. Then <clears throat> be fruitful. He blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. That's another one. I don't know how many of you are awake to that. What was God's plan starting with one man? To fill the earth, right? Is the earth full? So why are we hearing so, so much noise about overpopulation, blah, 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 blah. I don't know that you're hearing these things. You hear them so much that it's now a mantra. Those of you who work with some organizations, it is just accepted to be the right thing. If God has said this, then let me just say this. Anyone who says something to the contrary, check out who are they. What are they up to? Last year, there was an incident which went under the radar. I don't know how many of you got to know. Because now the news is so controlled that what makes news shouldn't, doesn't make news. <clears throat> there was an incident. Uh, I don't know how many of you, have you heard of the, um, what, what were these stones in Atlanta? The guide stones? Mm -hmm. Are they called guide stones? Yes. There are, there are two big pillars, big monuments, huge. In Atlanta, Georgia, with the 10, you know, kind of commandments or something. And it was very clearly written there, whoever, no one knows who put them up, by the way. Mysteriously, one night they blew up. Some think it was lightning. Others think uh, somebody blew them up. Now, normally those sort of things should make world news. By the evening of the next day, they had all been removed. One of the things there was a statement that the earth, to, to sustain the earth, the population of the earth should be kept at a 500 million. That's the optimum population. 500 million people. We are now at 8 billion, right? Hmm? Go, go and look at the Georgia Guidestones letter and find out. Those things are there. It did not make news. If you're not on certain groups, you never know what happened. That particular place was on a ley line uh, from the Washington Monument, uh, if I remember correctly, 666 something. So there's been a lot of noise about depopulation when it was made, conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there are people in this earth who are bent on depopulation. And if you haven't woken up to it, wake up, wake up. Wake up. So, fill the earth. Be fruitful. Fill the earth. That's God's plan. That was his mandate. That was, you know, when you create something and you have a, give it a commission, that's what God talked about mankind. Now, I'm not going to all the arguments about too many kids and so on. I'm just saying, why are some people making it their life mission to challenge that? And who is inspiring them? And what are they doing today to fulfill that? 
you'll be shocked when you go know the full details of what they're doing. Okay. So I have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So that was how the journey started. I'm going to run through the rest of the journey. So you know the fall of man, uh, Adam and Eve sin, and God makes a promise that the seed of the <laughs> the seed of the of the of the the woman will break, will, will, will crush the head of the serpent and so on and so on. So we know that you follow that journey down to the time of Noah when there was so much wickedness on the earth. Um, let me just get this up here. Yeah, the, the times of Noah um, the, and the sons of Noah, uh, Uncle Eben referred to the sons of Ham from which the African continent descends. Uh, but then you have the sons of Japheth and the sons of Shem. And then you come the time of Abraham and God now, God had made a statement for we are so privileged that we can look back and we understand the story because we've got the privilege of hindsight. Huh? But the people who lived at that time did not really understand what God was up to. So uh, Abraham, uh, then God now reveals a little more of his plan. Tells Abraham, you know, that through your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham obeys God and, you know, comes into the land. Then he has Isaac, he has Jacob. Then you have the 12 sons of Jacob, Joseph being one of them. Joseph is sold to Egypt. They come into Egyptian captivity. And um, from a family, total number who moved were 70, the Bible tells us. Within about 400 years, they have gone to about probably 3 or 4 million people. They have multiplied. God has blessed them abundantly. God now speaks to Moses and draws them to take them back into the land and in, and in Exodus 19, we see after three months of leaving Egypt, they come to Mount Sinai. And they camp there for just about a year. During that time, God is reorganizing them into a nation. So they get the laws, the commandments, all these instructions. They take a census. They, they left one night in a, in, a, in, a, in a mob. You know, not a mob, but a rush. Just get out, everyone. Twilight, you know. Uh, the Egyptians say, go, they all leave. It must have been a very disorganized bunch of people. They're all moving, trying to keep their families together. You know, they come to the crossing of the Red Sea. They have had no time to breathe. They cross the Red Sea, one of the most powerful miracles in the Bible. As one person said, God only parted, did not part the Red Sea. He also tarmacked it, you know. <laughs> Overnight, he tarmacked. Because you think about what's at the bottom of the sea. And you have all these kids and old women and so on. God, that, that miracle, I mean, I can preach now on that miracle. So they cross over the other side. Three months later, they come to Mount Sinai. Three months after they in the third month. They come there. Exodus 19, God tells them that now therefore, if you'll indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You know, priests and kings. God has always had this in his heart from the very beginning. Priests and kings. I believe that was what Adam was. He was both a priest, he related with God, he was a king on the earth. That is something that, even with the fall, God was bringing us back uh, to that place. And uh, God says, these are the three words shall speak the children of Israel. Now, you know the story again. They go, um, about after they leave the Mount Sinai, they move to Kadesh Barnea. Uh, they sent out 12 spies. God was ready. But the spies, again, because of their narrative, their narrative, they turned the hearts of the people and uh, they end up with 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They now have to, to enter the land from the eastern side. Uh, Joshua leads the entry into the land. Joshua leads the conquest of the land, the division of the land. Then you have the time of the judges. Um, and uh, 13 or so judges become the time of Samuel. And then David. Samuel anoints the first two kings, Saul and David. So David comes on the scene. And David is the king that really, if you look at the map of David's conquest and you look at the promise of the land given to Abraham, King David is the one that brought them to the, to the fullness of that land. You can do a Bible study later and find out. That was a great time in Israel. You know, for warfare, maybe it was not as great, but definitely the days of his son were very great. You know, He fought all these battles, subdued all the enemies. By the time he's over with his work, uh, it's like uh, you almost think maybe he delayed a bit because he's now asking God to do the things concerning the next generation. God says, no, 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 no. You have served your purpose. <laughs> You're now beginning to touch the next generation stuff. So, so he prepares for the son. Solomon comes on the, three, on the scene and Israel has entered this golden age. 
Every man lived under his uh, vine and fig tree. Every, there were no homeless people. There was so much money that gold and silver became like stones. The, this was the time when this was the number one nation in the whole world. David was, Solomon, David was epitomizing what Christ would do himself in the years to come. You know, all the kings of the earth are coming uh, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. This was the place you wanted to be. One among those, the queen of Sheba who comes and, and gets a revelation about what God has done. That God has actually caused Solomon to sit on his father's throne and to exercise righteousness and justice. Which is really the picture of the throne of God. Are we together? Yes, sir. You know, preaching after lunch. If your, if your neighbor is, is beginning to have dreams and visions, just... <laughs> now, from the time of Solomon, Solomon, um, Solomon, you remember after Solomon, Solomon backslides, basically. And his son, Aroboam, takes over, doesn't take up the advice of the elders, and as a result, the kingdom is torn into two. You have the northern kingdom read by Jeroboam and the southern kingdom read by Aroboam. And everyone is looking back to the golden age. Don't we all do that? The good old days. Sometimes the good old days are not as good as they were. But anyway, we look back to them. Now, when you read the story of the kings um, of Judah and Israel, it was that longing. That longing to when will we go back? When will there be another? God had promised that someday a king like David would show up. But all these prophets, the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs, they are, it's, it's that nostalgia to this king who would come and take us back to our golden age. Hmm? Um, the prophets, you find a lot in the prophets, the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs, they're writing about, one, you know, one, I'll bring back my servant David on the throne. So all of them knew that there was a great time when we were number one in the world, you know, where the richest, where the best, where the, and when will God bring that back? He has promised, but when will it happen? So this long restoration. But the kingdom just slide down, 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 until eventually the, the northern kingdom, Israel, Ephraim, is taken by the Assyrians into exile. About 100 or so years later, the southern kingdom is taken by the Babylonians. And uh, everything in Jerusalem is finally destroyed. There's hardly anything left there except the poorest people in the land, it says. Now, I want to pick up the story from here and expand it a bit more because it's very relevant to our discussion. During this exile, one of the young boys who was taken out is called Daniel. He's taken into the palace of the king of the, now the biggest kingdom at the time, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. A contemporary of his was called Ezekiel, who seemed to have gone uh, a little later, went later. We don't know whether they met, but they were in Babylon at the same time. Um, and it's very interesting when you study them and just a picture of how God deals with us. Daniel is called into government. Huh? All his dreams and visions are about government. Hmm? Ezekiel was a priest. All his dreams are about the temple. You know, God speaks to you according to what you're called. There are, there are, God will speak to me through dentistry, there are things you will not understand. Uh, and he will speak to an engineer. You know, if God wanted to show me a vision for an aeroplane, he, would, he wouldn't come to me because I don't, I don't know those things. So wherever you are, God will speak to you in that language. He knows it. Amen. So now Daniel was one of the young boys that, that was taken um, into Babylon. And you know the story. I'm not going to go through all the details of the story. But some interesting things happen here. And uh, I want to really focus um, on... Uh, on uh, what happens in chapter 2? I keep wondering, God, of all people, okay, there was Daniel, there was Ezekiel, but God chooses <laughs> to show his plan for the, uh, for the ages to a heathen king. King Nebuchadnezzar is asleep and uh, he gets his dream. The dream is so powerful. You know, there are some dreams you get and you can't even remember you know, whether you're half asleep or not. Or maybe you ate too much food or something like that. But this guy wakes up and the vision, dream is so vivid. Uh, when I, in the past, when I read this passage, I thought he had forgotten the dream. No, he hadn't. This was a very smart guy. He was smart enough to know that this, whatever I received last night is so important that I can't just give it away. Uh, I need to know what it really means. 
you know, if I came today and gave you a picture of a dream I had, I may get 400 interpretations. Yeah. Especially if I say, if you don't give me an interpretation, you're going to die. <laughs> you will give me an interpretation. The spirit of revelation will come upon you suddenly. <laughs> But Nebuchadnezzar says, you know what? The only way I can be sure that the revelation is correct is if you can tell me the dream. If you claim you magicians and wise men, if you claim that you serve the gods, let the gods who gave me this vision give it to you. If you can tell me what I dreamt, then I'll be sure about the interpretation. The man was so troubled. So he sends out the word, and of course the guy said, Lord, king, live forever. You know, this thing has never, it's not possible. They realized, the guy said, you guys, you think I'm joking? You know? They realize the man is serious. He says, you're all, you're all useless. You're all going to die. The guys are begging for time, so he just tells Ariok, the captain of the guard, get rid of them. Now, I don't know where Daniel was. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, the, the, according to the story in chapter 2, they come for Daniel. Daniel is wondering, what is the matter? Because... <laughs> Daniel had an unenviable job of being the minister in charge of witch doctors. I don't know how many of you like that assignment. <laughs> I don't know how he did his work. You know, being, being in charge of all the magicians and astrologers, and you're the head. But for some reason, he had not heard about this command. So he asked the guy, the Bible says, he deals a lot of wisdom. What, what, is, <laughs> what, is, what is going on? Why is it so urgent? So Ariok tells him, so he moves with a lot of wisdom, comes to Nebuchadnezzar and says, just give me time. He was able to buy time where the others failed to buy time. But man, it's easy to tell this story, but you imagine you're Daniel. If God does not speak, it's over. You know it. It's over. It's over. So he gathers his friends. They have a time of prayer. Uh, <laughs> I find it interesting that he says God showed it to me in a dream. So they didn't have an overnight. They slept at some point. <laughs> I don't know how many of you would sleep. When you say now, God, you've prayed enough, let us sleep. <laughs> but God shows him exactly. When he wakes up, he knows. And I really love this, you know, imagining this passage. <clears throat> Uh, of Daniel coming before, <laughs> before the king. Because now, the, <clears throat> if you read the story, it's really interesting. Ariok, when Ariok now, I think Ariok interviewed Daniel and he knew that, hey, this guy, this guy seems to have it. Because Ariok, the army commander, comes before the, the king and says, I have found a man. Now, you wouldn't say that if you know that the, if the guy gets it wrong, they'll come after you. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy might probably thought it's a chance to cash in, no? Huh? I can get promotion also in case these things turn out right. So anyway, the king, um, the, the message goes in, um, we'll talk about this, we'll quickly talk about that. Verse 29, to verse 49. To you, I'll, I'll pick out some of the passages. Um, I'll read, let me read out some of them on the screen, some I not. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me. So we are talking about the counsel of God. Okay? Not because of any wisdom that I have, I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. <clears throat> you saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness. Just imagine <laughs> you're in that room, you know, be a fly on the wall, as they say. And here is Nebuchadnezzar listening, you know, weighing up this young man and wondering where the man would begin. And the man begins to talk about an image and immediately gets Nebuchadnezzar's attention. He says, yes, it was an image. And he begins now to unfold, gives detail, detail, and everything is exactly the same. Can you imagine the impact on Nebuchadnezzar? Mm -hmm. No? Its appearance was frightening. So he even got the emotions that Nebuchadnezzar had in the dream. He even pulled that out. It was frightening. The head was made of fine gold, chest and arms of silver, middle and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, its feet partly iron and partly clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. And it struck the image of feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. 
Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken in pieces. That was a deadly blow. It was such a powerful blow that this huge image just collapsed, you know, and became, uh, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away. No more image anymore, you know. So that not a trace, wow, not a trace of them could be found. This was a wind that took away everything from a huge frightening image to nothing. But as you watched, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. Be fruitful and do what? Be fruitful and do what? And do what? And do what? Fill the earth. Now this, this thing, this stone, fills the earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. Uh, you know the Bible, the Holy Spirit is too much of an editor. Sometimes I wish you would tell us a bit more. I, <laughs> you know, it says by the end of this whole thing, Nebuchadnezzar was flowing flat before, before Daniel. So if you started off sitting like this, then like this, then like this. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heavens has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and into whose hands he was given, he has given wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the earth, making you rule over them. This sounds again like Genesis. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you, to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks into pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, shall break and crush all these. And as you sow the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, still the fourth kingdom. But some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it, just as you sow iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron, partly clay, so the, king shall, the, the kingdom shall be partly... Um, Sorry, it shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron brit uh, mixed with soft clay, so they shall mix with one another in marriage, but they shall not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It shall never be destroyed. Amen. Never nor shall it be left to any other people. But it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cast from a mountain by no human hand. By the way, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when you think about mountain, think about kingdom. When you think about temple, you may draw lessons for the church, but we are talking about the kingdom of God coming from heaven the kingdom of heaven, and coming to earth and bringing down all the structures of mankind and getting them crushed and blown away by the wind and becoming a mountain that fills the whole earth. Are we together? Yes. This is what we are talking about. We are talking about the counsel of God, the intentions of God. And the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, a great God has made known to king what shall be after this. The counsel of God was given to a heathen. The dream is certain. Its interpretation is sure. Now, I don't even know where... I, okay, Daniel stated those things. <clears throat> he was speaking about things even to our day. And he says it is certain, it is sure. We have a great privilege today because we live centuries later. And this scripture has been largely fulfilled to the dot. Yeah. After the Roman Empire, as you can see, the Medo-Persian Empire, it even had two arms, the Medes and the Persians. Yeah? Then you had the Greek Empire in the loin area, the reproductive area. Greek thinking has been as fertilized all civilizations after that. The Romans took over, but they were controlled by the Greek thinking. Even today, Greek thinking is dominant up to today. Okay? And then the Roman Empire that followed. Now, 
what we need to appreciate here, and again, this may be basic for a lot of you, but I want to really, you know, we have to be very clear about this because if we are not, there's a lot of confusion that I'll address even more tomorrow. So this was the image. I mean, this was a powerful vision that God used as a picture to paint the picture of centuries. But the very firm statement he makes in, um, in, um, in, in, in uh, verse uh, 31. Okay. We have verse 43, actually. And in the days of those kings, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Um, <clears throat> now, remember this is the time of the exile. Okay? Um, then we have Daniel. There are a lot of other things, visions. Another vision of Daniel I'll come to, uh, I'll come to in, a, in a bit. Very powerful vision. Um, then you have the Daniel living, you have the, the Ezra's, the um, Nehemiah's, there's a return, okay? Then you have all those prophets who lived at that time, the Haggai's, the, Mal the Malachi's, uh, and, uh, and, and the other Zacharias who prophesied at that time. <coughs> and now the prophets of Daniel got to be known. And there's a, a longing, there's a deep longing for this promise now that will... When will this kingdom come? Now it's the, the, there's an understanding. You know, God's progression, revelation has been progressive. The Isaiahs had prophecies they gave as well, and Jeremiah's about a coming kingdom. And now there is a, a word that uh, in the days of the Fourth Empire, which we know is the Roman Empire now, um, that God would do something. God would begin to do something. And the question we ask when you read through the Bible, does this happen? And the answer is yes. Let me just bring this out to you clearly. When you look at the Old Testament, you don't read so much about the reign of the Messiah. The reign of God was something the Jews looked forward to. And by the way, they do not look forward to heaven as we look forward to now. They were seeing a time when God would come on the earth and get rid of the wicked. That's the image they had. Uh, they begin, began longing for the Messiah. There was a very, very deep yearning. And because of they were under oppression, this age, the, the, the term this age, this apocalyptic, apocalyptic period, on that time of the, 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 the Daniel plus, this age was this wicked age where there's sickness, there's death, you know, there are, we are being oppressed by our enemies. Then there's the age to come when the Messiah will come and get rid of all these problems. But this was the longing, given up the time of Jesus coming. When will the Messiah come and sort us out? <clears throat> you come into the New Testament and the reign of God, the kingdom of God, which is not mentioned very much before that. All of a sudden, in the book of Mark, it's mentioned 14 times. 14 times. In the book of Luke, 37 times, the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew, 51 times. So in the Gospels, over 100 times you're coming across the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. And that was the excitement that the Jews had when Jesus showed up on the scene. Because they're saying, wow, the time has come. The son of David is here. You know? He's about to sort out all our issues. But just to drive the point home here, so that we can see the connection with the fourth empire we talked about, uh, it says in uh, Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Who was Caesar Augustus? He was one of those kings. One of the kings, the Roman Empire. Are you getting that? In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will do something. You know, who will begin now. Uh, we, of course, now we have the privilege living 2,000 years after it happens. We, know, we understand better that it was not all going to happen at once. But God had said that something would happen on the earth that would bring together all these human systems and leave no trace of them. Are we together? I'm praying the Lord is beginning to push through some of your counsel. Now, let me just make another very important point, which I'll come back to. After this stone comes, is there another kingdom? I'll ask the question again. A stone was cast out from, not by human hands, the mountain in heaven, right? Now, that's the kingdom of heaven. And that stone we know is Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Uh, I'm just going to unpack it to you in a moment so that you see it clearly. Um, he begins something on the earth. 
Now, the coming of that stone marks the beginning of the destruction of this image, right? Is there another thing in that dream? Does it show another kingdom that will rule over the earth? So I'll ask one question and leave it now. So why are we expecting something to happen that is going to rule over the whole earth? Why is most of the body of Christ now expecting something that is going to rule over the whole earth? I'll leave it at that. We shall come back to it. I'm telling you, we are in the age of psychological warfare. If I can control the way you think, I can win a battle without you going to fight. So I hope you're disturbed enough, you know, and you won't sleep tonight. But you will need to answer that question. Okay. Now, so it was in the days. Now, later on, a few years later, we read about John the Baptist eating grasshoppers. Ah, locusts, grasshoppers. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Who was Tiberius Caesar? Again, you don't miss it. The Holy Spirit makes sure you do not miss when this event is happening. If they just say Jesus showed up and did things, no, they mention the kings. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven would do something. Are we together? Okay. And they, so they mentioned Pontius Pilate and uh, Brother Philip um, and all that and all that and all that. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that this is captured clearly. So in those days, John the Baptist appears on the scene. And what is he saying? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These guys who have been waiting for the kingdom of heaven. They are waiting for the Messiah to come and sort out. And this, this was good. I mean, this was like news from my goodness. The time has come. It's now. We are the privileged people. And then, <laughs> um, okay, let me just bring this up as well. This is just an image. It shows uh, this age, the, the, the term this age. The, the apocalyptic age I was talking about as they waited. You know, the 400 years of silence. The last prophet being Malachi. There was a great longing for the remanifestation of the kingdom of David. And that's where the term this age and the age to come was formulated. It was a longing for the God of heaven to intervene in this evil age. And this evil age was characterized by sickness, wickedness, death. <clears throat> the age to come was the rule of God. The term kingdom of God was part of the age to come. So when you talk about the kingdom of God, it was connected to the next age, you know. And this was the expectation. When John the Baptist appears on the scene and says the kingdom of heaven is at here, it's like, wow. You know, the time has come. We're going to see this, you know. So John the Baptist comes, and then Jesus comes to be baptized by him. And we see heaven talking about the father saying, this is my son. Um, and Jesus himself tells us in, uh, in, uh, in Luke 16, 16, that the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is being preached. So Jesus presents the same image, but the people are not really understanding. They don't have a full understanding of what it is. And this is the understanding. When the disciples were called and began to walk with Jesus, this guy said, man, <laughs> in Uganda, they began saying, Tuli uh, we are in the thing. When they began to realize this is the next big thing to happen. And guess what? We are spending time with him. And that would help you understand why there was a big conflict among the disciples towards the time of the crucifixion. You know, I, for a long time I thought, oh, they knew it was going to be crucified. They were talking about the heavenly kingdom. No. These guys were campaigning for cabinet posts. <laughs> <clears throat> they were campaigning. That's how Judas was also deceived because they all knew, Judas knew he had already bagged the Ministry of Finance. You know? Yeah. Now they are fighting for vice president and uh, prime minister. You know, the two brothers, James and John. That's an interesting study. It caused so much conflict. You think they were talking about dying and going to heaven? No. They knew Jesus was about to take over everything. So Judas even thinks, oh, you know what? After all, it's going to take over everything. I may as well cash in some money in this and the process. By the time he's there, I also have some money in my pocket. That's why when he realized Jesus was doing nothing and was actually dead, he said, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've killed an innocent man. The lights come on. But they're all expecting something to happen. All this time they were saying, it was, it was, they were all thinking, hoping, no? He's been captured by the Romans. Let's see what will happen. Nothing. They see Jesus being beaten all night by the high priest. Next morning, is when he came out of the praetorium, those guys were in shock. Their Lord was a bloody mess. 
could not believe what they were seeing. The women were weeping. He ends up on the cross. This was just the worst nightmare that could ever happen. And I'll show you why. I'll show you in a moment. That this, this, is their, this was their mindset. Now, let's go back to Jesus. <coughs> Jesus appears and uh, he's talking about the kingdom. And there are a number of verses I put up here. I'm going to go through all of them. He says, after that time, um, it, it, he comes saying it is fulfilled. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This new kingdom that was coming on the earth. You know, time is fulfilled. Repent, believe in the gospel, you know. And he also says that the primary reason for his coming was the kingdom. Now when it was day, he departed, went to the, the uh, deserted place. That's uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 43. The crowd sought him and came to him and they tried to keep him from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. Uh, of course, for this purpose, I've, sent, I've been sent and was preaching the synagogues of Galilee. And he instructs the disciples uh, to preach the kingdom. You know, so there are a number of verses here. I just want to bring out the fact that this was the major thing. When he was casting out demons, he was saying things that the kingdom is among you. His teaching was a bit confusing to them. Sometimes he talked about a future kingdom. Other times it was like it was already here. You know? Like here in uh, uh, Luke chapter 11. But if by the finger of God I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come. When a strong man armed, guards his own place, palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. And of course here Jesus is a stronger man who has come to bind the devil, spoil his, to spoil his, uh, his goods. Uh, Luke 17, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come, he then answers them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So in some context, he's talking about the kingdom here. In other context, he's talking about the kingdom uh, happening in the future. Mark 14, for example, uh, that uh, last supper, he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Um, Luke 16, um, 27, 20, 28. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and, when, and then he'll repay each one according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there's some standing here will not test death until they see the Son of Man coming in this kingdom. So some of these messages were, were confusing to them. But uh, we are in a much better position to understand. And then um, Jesus himself was a confusion. Because you know, he came out of the box. Normally if, you expect, if you're expecting a, this great grand messiah, son of David, you know, you'd probably expect there'll be some special thing happening. But his birth was just less than ordinary. You know? In, in, a, in, a, in a manger. <clears throat> His upbringing was so normal that uh, when he began talking all these things, uh, they could not do a thing. This guy has gone crazy, you know. We lived with him here. We bought his furniture as a carpenter. We married his sisters. So how can he be the Messiah? <laughs> and then his company, the, his guys he was hanging around with, the disciples, and uh, what really, you know, rocked the religious establishment the wrong way was his, his, um, the things he said about them. You know. But they could not deny his acts. They could not deny what he was doing. You know, the raising of the dead, the uh, healing of the sick, and all that kind of stuff. Multiplying bread. You know. Now, the most difficult thing for them was the fact that he died. He died. This is a scene from uh, the Passion of the Christ. You may remember that. They were expecting a conquering king who would drive out militarily the Romans. And uh, the day he walked that triumphant entry, which we are about to observe, huh? Palm Sunday, that day, you know what those guys were singing? Hosanna to the son of David, right? That was a political term. That was a very loaded political term. You, tell, you call someone the son of David, what are you saying? You know, you're connecting him to this David son who will come and set up the thing we're all looking for. So, you know, the thing, it was not a riot. It was a, a great celebration, his Jerusalem. Uh, they take off their clothes. 
And if any of them had read Zechariah chapter 9, they would have said, aha, the day has come. Verse 9, you know. See your king. Behold your king coming, riding lowly on a, on a, on a, on a donkey. The next verse, what does it say? Verse 10. He will drive out the war chariots from Ephraim. So they are now waiting till the Romans are finished. The Messiah has come. He ends up in the temple whipping them. <laughs> and then, you know, it was, a, it was a Passover feast time. So all these Jews were gathered. Um, a big disappointment. To a point where they, they probably the same crowd. We know it was the same crowd. They, 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 they deny him, the, release Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And this guy is dead. What, what a sham. Another Messiah, another false Messiah in our midst. You know, those who had walked close with him were really disturbed. They were saying, now, this is a big disappointment, very big disappointment. Uh, of course, they are from Galilee. They are hiding in different, you know, corners, small, I don't know what you call them here. In, in, in Uganda, it's a cafon, <laughs> small little house. They are all hidden. They were in Jerusalem for the feast. They didn't live in Jerusalem. They lived in Galilee, but they had come for the feast of Passover. And... Um, then on the third day, you know the story, amazing story. You know this, wow, resurrection story is just so powerful. That day, uh, two men are walking on the road to a mouse. Huh? And Jesus appears to them. They don't know it's him. And they're talking, you know, these terrible things that have happened. You know, it's just horrible, horrible, you know. You know? Then, then he, he pretends he doesn't know what they're talking about. He says, what things? <laughs> Uh, and they say, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to, to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now look at the next words. We had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Had he redeemed Israel? Yes, on the cross he had. But they were looking for another type of redemption. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all these things, now it's the third day, they begin talking about the women and the women and all that. And this event, that day was a powerful day, you know. Let me not get tempted to go into it. Because even when, you, when you sit down and begin to put yourself there, and imagine you are the woman, women who went to the to the tomb, and then you're running to tell Peter, and then Peter comes and sees, and John, and they disappear, and Mary Magdalene is there. That was a day. That day, that day was a very, in fact, that's the most important day in Christianity as far as I'm concerned. All this Chris, Christmas stuff, it's something else. The day of the resurrection was the very first day this earth saw what the new creation will look like. Amen. That morning was the very first morning that a man had gone into the grave and had come out of the grave Amen. and was clothed in the new body. Amen. For the very first time, creation saw it. Mm. And those human beings that saw it that morning saw it for the very first time. It was a fortest. Now, that's one of the signs that for the Jewish mind, the resurrection is always connected with the last day. Daniel chapter 12, you know. At that time, many who are dead. So the, anything to do with the resurrection was connected to the new, to the, the kingdom, the age to come. Now, God had pulled the age to come into time. And Jesus comes out of that grave. He comes out of that grave. The future has been pulled into the present. The future has been pulled into the present. Because the resurrection belongs to the future. It has already begun. It has already begun. The future has made its way into the present. Jesus had triumphed over Satan. He had even said the night before, now is the God of this age cast out. Okay? Satan had been defeated at his final point of power, death. He had been soundly, soundly defeated. God had entered human history, grabbed Satan by the throat and conquered him. And the resurrection had begun. You know, and we are told it's a word that we do not know what it will be like, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Now, I just want to spend a little time on this resurrection bit because there's an aspect I want to bring out uh, which is linked to our theme. And I'd like to take us back to that resurrection morning. Again, you need to reconstruct. And I did a study of this and I was just getting all the different 
writers and trying to reconstruct the sequence of events because not everything is actually written there. For example, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about him appearing to Peter. Paul talks about it, but there's no record in the, in the Gospels about that. So not everything has been said. But suffice it to say that he first appeared to the women. Oh, the women are weak. Amen. <laughs> Uh, now, Mary Magdalene runs in the morning. It's still dark. So she's running, and you can imagine how she's gone there. She does not see the, 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 the Lord's body. She believes it's been stolen. Um, now, something happens at that point. I also want to say this. We know there were angels around the time of Jesus, uh, his life on earth. There were angels that ministered to him on Gethsemane. There were angels that were there that could not do anything. Because he said, if I called, he told, as it, the pilot told, I could just call them, and the, but they couldn't do anything because this plan had to go through. So they watched, but I can tell you, on resurrection morning, it was a different spirit. It was different. So they go down there, pick up um, the Lord, bring him back, and the women see two angels. I, I personally believe Michael was very involved. Michael is the angel of the resurrection. If you read the book of Daniel, this was a very big assignment that they had uh, to make sure Jesus came out of the grave, and you can imagine the excitement. First of all, in the spirit realm, then among the women. So Mary's running... Bang, 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 bang. We've been to the tomb. The Lord is not there. Peter, <laughs> Peter must have been fast asleep. You know, you're terrified and there's a bang on the door. You don't know if the Roman soldiers are come or not. But uh, it's a woman's voice that comes through. You realize it's Mary. They run. Mm, they, they, they outrun. Uh, well, John, John also wakes up. They shared a room that day. <laughs> <laughs> So John is younger, and they, are, they want to be sure uh, they got some courage because they knew they were soldiers there. <laughs> they get there, and uh, John gets there. I don't know if he was scared or what. He stops at the door. The stone has been rolled away. Peter comes and just enters, and he sees the cloth is, you know. But that's a very powerful story there. You know about the cloth? You know, the carpenters, when they are finished, they would fold the towel. If you went to get your job from a carpenter in those days, if, if you did not find the carpenter's towel on your job, whatever furniture you wanted, no, it's not yet finished. When the carpenter finished his work, he would fold the towel he was using and put it on the work. If you found that, you know it was done. So Peter gets the message. Jesus, you know, raises from the dead. If you are the one who rose from the dead, you know, I'd say, wow, I'm alive. You know, just throw off the clothes and run out of the tomb. No, Jesus had the composure to rise from the dead and fold the clothes and leave them there. So the message is, it is done, it is finished, it is done. There is no more sacrifice, no need for anything else. So these guys now are confused. So they take off. Now they are thinking, I think their minds are going, ha, there are no soldiers here. What is Pilate going to do? When this body, so we're going to be suspect number one. Let's take off. <laughs> Let's just disappear from here. Find some place to hide until this feast is over. We, we go back to where we came from. Mary hangs around. She's weeping. Now something happens. You know, Jesus, Jesus revealed himself to her. The very, well, Jesus reveals him. If I mix up the story a bit, but Jesus reveals himself. Now she's weeping. She can't see. Then she hears the voice and she recognizes the voice. You know, if your mom came and started talking out there, you'd recognize. If you've, if you've been with your mom for some time, you just wonder, what is my mom doing here? If my mom started speaking outside here and I had a, I'd say, what is she doing in Nairobi, you know? And Mary had that experience. Like, what is that? Then she realizes it's the Lord. Now, the Lord tells her something, says, don't touch me. You remember that? Yeah. Okay. Don't touch me. Don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending. What was he going to do? I am ascending to my, my your father, my God, and your God. Okay? Now, as you see on the screen there, 10 verses later, same day. Uh, uh, well, not this, not this is later. This is about eight days later when he tells, he tells uh, Thomas, touch me. But let me take you back the story. The lady Mary now follows this people now, says, I've seen the Lord. There's this vibe now. Huh? SMSs are going ping, 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 ping. <laughs> the disciples' WhatsApp group is just alive, you know? Uh, so the two men going to a mouse, they have also got the WhatsApp message saying the women, some women say, this is confusing. They're talking to Jesus. They don't realize Jesus is with them. They get to a mouse, which is about 17, oh, seven miles away. So it's a long walk. They, they are, they, those guys were walking with Jesus for quite a while. And if you read that passage, it says he begins to explaining from the prophets and all these things. It's getting dark. Come in, stay the night with us. And he, he, you know, he was going to just go. The Lord is just so gracious. He will not force himself into your house. <laughs> well, he was saying, bye guys, see you. Oh, nice talking to you. He says, no, 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 come and stay with us. So they sit there, they put the bread before the table. He breaks the bread and their eyes are open. He disappears. It's dark. These guys are, they also, now they don't have WhatsApp messages. They would have just quickly put the status. <laughs> But it's but dark. It's the only thing they could do is go there physically. Physical SMS. <laughs> so they jump back. It's dark. They walk, run, walk, I don't know what, all the way back to Jerusalem. And bang, 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 bang. The disciples are terrified. Another bang. The Roman soldiers have arrived on us. They reach. They are talking about this thing. Jesus appears. Then he says, they think it's a ghost. They're all shocked. Then he says, a ghost does not have flesh. Touch. You know, eat. Give me something to eat. My question is, what happened between the morning and the evening? Touch me not. Touch me. And this is what I believe happened. Um, let me first explain it. Then I'll show you an image that Daniel saw, which is just so powerful. Jesus had died as the, given his life as a great high priest. He had to take, you know, we are told the earthly tabernacles were copies of the heavenly one. Okay? So he had to take his blood as evidence up there. And I'll just give you, this is um, Hebrews 9.11. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his creation, he entered... So we know he entered. The question is when. I personally believe it was that day. That very resurrection day. He entered once and for all into the holy places. Not made by means of the blood of gods and cows. But by means of his own blood. Thus securing an eternal redemption. Hebrews 9.23 Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things. To be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven himself to appear in the presence of God. So he had to come back to the Father and say, Father, it's done. It is done. Now, this is a vision and uh, again, this is my interpretation, so we don't have to fight over this. But I'll tell you why I believe this is it. Powerful vision. I, for many times I read, for many years I've read this vision, I thought this was a picture of Christ coming back to the earth. But no, that isn't it. Daniel sees a vision. From, I'll read from verse 13. It says, I was watching the night seasons, and behold, one like the Son of Man. So this is Daniel. Now we've gone back to Daniel. Okay? Coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, pause. Coming with the clouds of heaven. What does that mean? 
When you say coming, you know it's coming towards where you are, right? If I say so-and-so is coming. So the question is, where was Daniel when he saw this vision? What was his position? Because if he was on the earth, then you could say he was coming to the earth. But look at the passage carefully. I say, I saw one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days. So where was Daniel? He was heaven. He was in heaven. God lifted him to the third heaven and gave him a vantage position where he could see. And he's in, it's, well, I don't know if he was relating the throne of God, but he sees the son of man coming. The question is, when did this happen? The son of man is coming with the clouds of heaven. That could also be a picture of the saints, of the angels. But there's a host coming with him. Hmm? And he comes to the ancient of days. They brought him near before him. Who is they? <laughs> I told you the resurrection must have had millions of angels. I, Michael must have been very active with this company. Jesus just posed, pressed the pause button because of Mary's devotion. As the others were all, you know, running, Mary stayed there. She was not afraid of the shoulders. She was, not, she was just weeping. In the, Jesus said, I, let me just pause my journey and appear to this lady. So when Mary is wanting to hug him, he says, wait, I have not yet gone. So now, after he's finished with Mary, go and tell your disciple, Mary is so excited. She believes. She doesn't even doubt. She's just so excited. I think if you... I want to watch a video of Mary running to, to meet the, the disciples. I think she was floating in the air. I don't think she was even running. No? And Jesus continues, and Jesus is coming to heaven. God allows Daniel, pushes him into the future, and allows him to see this amazing event of Jesus coming and being brought before the ancient of days, being brought before the Father. Now, very big summary. Very big summary. I actually personally believe Revelation 5 happened at this time. He's brought before him. He's given dominion, power, glory, and the kingdom. And all peoples and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It shall never pass away. His kingdom is the one that shall not be destroyed. How do I know this happened? Well, I know a few days later, Jesus himself says, all authority has been given to me. It has happened. This is not a future event that's going to happen. It has happened. It was occasioned by the death and resurrection, the vicarious death on the cross. And um, I'll pull in another, another passage that intercessors like. But to me, this, this just sounds like this may have been one of the sins. You know, when you read Psalm 22, you know, you've read Psalm 22, which is, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is reciting that psalm on the cross. And if you study it, you know, they have divided my clothes, you know, all my bones are out of joint, all that thing. Jesus was reciting it on the cross. I believe Psalm 24 applies powerfully here. This is a psalm we like. Uh, the earth is the Lord's. Can you now just picture it in this context, whatever you think, just picture it. Christ has died. He has paid for the earth. He has bought it back. The angels are singing. They are rejoicing. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. He has founded it upon the seas. Let's read it together. And established it upon the waters. Now, can you imagine a conversation? Just look at a different context. A conversation between the angels. They are ascending to the throne of God. Then one of them asks the question, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, no one can describe that, can befit that better than Jesus. Pure hands, uh, uh, clean hands, a uh, pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to what is false, even refused to worship the devil. When the devil said, worship me, you know, and I'll give you all these things. He does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord. Now Jesus is coming to receive his blessing. Okay? And the righteousness from the God of his salvation, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face, the God of Jacob. Look at the next verse. Uh, 
I've, I think I've, I've mixed up the verses here. Let me just see. Okay, I need to get it out. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't put this up properly. Okay, yeah, I think it's here. I just didn't copy it down in my notes. So, now the angels are approaching the gates of heaven. So, they are crying out, lift up your heads, all your gates, and be lifted up, your everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come in. Now, there are angels in heaven who are calling back. And they're asking, who is the king of glory? Who's this king of glory? These angels come. The Lord strong, the Lord mighty in battle. He has just been through the greatest battle there will ever be. And he has overcome. Are we together? So the angels say, huh? They, then they shout, lift up your heads, all you gates. Let me lift up your everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come in. And they ask again, who is this king of glory? So the Lord comes in. Of course, the ancient gates are lifted. Jesus comes back. The excitement in heaven is something else. He has to go to the temple. And then, this morning, Brother Temeka described another scene. As he's coming there, there is this thing about the, the, the scroll. Who is worthy? And now there is someone worthy. All heaven and earth is called to attention. He has conquered. He has overcome. He's been slain. He's given authority and power as, he, as Daniel showed us just a, a while back. To him was given. You know, uh, his kingdom is an everlasting dominion. So now he has won back what Adam lost. Everything is in his hand. There is no need for a second death. There is no need for anything. Everything is finished. Are we together? Are you getting the picture of this thing? Are you getting excited about it? We need to understand this. Because if we don't, the enemy will keep deceiving us about something else Jesus has to do. There is no need for any other sacrifice. I mean, apart from all the things that he calls us to do. But this work is done. It is sealed. It's dusted. Finished. It is finished. Now, let me give an illustration. Um, I still have some more time. Let me give an illustration. Um, that's an image, um, 1979. <laughs> and I, was, I was in living in the city of Kampala then. I was a young boy. And oh, I was, that day I was not in the city. We had fled the city. That's the day Idi Amin was kicked out. <clears throat> we had pulled out of school. You know, we had to walk a long distance. Thought we'd wait for the Tanzanians to arrive. The bombs were too scary. You know, you Kenyans have not known war. But man, war is not a good thing. <laughs> huh? War. I have lived through two wars. You, you don't want to live through a war. The bombs were landing everywhere. We fled. It was a sudden rush out of the city after a night of bombardment. And um, so anyway, on the 11th, the city falls. Of course, there is no newspaper. The, I, I was looking for a headline. Just to illustrate the point, it was the Indian Express. Amin flees as Tanzania, Kenya falls to Tanzanians. And this was the headline, one of the head, headlines in, uh, in uh, the Indian Express. Debt, 12th April. 12th April, Kampala has fallen Tanzanian forces. But you know, I was in a part of the country that had not fallen yet. So even if you had the news, you had to celebrate behind closed doors. Because there are soldiers around, you know? And they were mad, you know? They, if you, if they, they would just shoot you. Hmm? Now, it took, uh, I don't know how many, one month later or so before the soldiers would reach the Sudan border. But when would the government fall? 12th of April. Done. That's the, that's, it goes down in history. Was all of Uganda liberated? No. Uh, some years later, I was a student at the university when um, Sevenese forces came in. You know, one night <laughs> we were in no man's land. On one side of the university were the retreating soldiers, on the other side were the incoming soldiers. And bombs were flying over us. But again, they come in, they take over. It's an announcement. In fact, before the whole country is liberated, just, if, just as soon as they take over, they swear in a new government. They still have to push the boundaries. Now, this is what has happened. Satan's headquarters were finished. The resurrection morning, it was done. Finished, done. So then he tells us, there's no question about 
another victory. Yeah? Yes, there are battles, and the battles we have to engage in now to enforce what has already happened. Amen. Mop up operations and so on. So Jesus now appears to the disciples uh, 40 days. He keeps appearing. <laughs> I taught on the resurrection at our church, and one brother asked a very interesting question. I didn't have an answer to. He was saying, but Brother James, Jesus was appearing, you know, that day appears again, he appears there. Where was he sleeping? <laughs> I don't know if I was going to heaven and coming back, but we know there's a final ascension. I didn't have an answer. So on that day, Jesus came, on the day of the Great Commission, he came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me. So it's that time it had happened. All authority had been given to me in heaven and on the earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We are still in that zone. But the basis of all that is Jesus has authority, which we had about this morning, the realms above heavens, under the earth, all creatures, all things, everything in them, it was done. Amen. Now, after the resurrection, what was his message? His message was the kingdom, 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 kingdom. Uh, Acts chapter 1, in the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit, the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom. This is the same kingdom Daniel saw. The God of heaven would set up a kingdom on earth that would well, bring down all these things and itself. That's the destiny of the kingdom of God. Am I talking to believers this afternoon? Yes. Amen. That's the, that's, that's, what, that's the project we are part of. That is the counsel of God. That's the project we are part of. And let me tell you, the enemy will do everything to make us believe otherwise. He will do everything to make us believe otherwise. To make us think of ourselves less than we are. To make us think of the plan of God less than it is. To make us think of the church less than it is. The very first statement Jesus made about the church... He said to Peter, you're Peter. No? He says, on this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not. Now, the gates of hell, gates we know are stationary structures. Huh? If the gates are not prevailing, it means that this church is attacking the gates of hell and the gates are not holding up. Are you getting the picture? It's not a church that is waiting in the corner to be rescued. It's a church that is advancing. It knows who they are. They are kings and priests. They are advancing against the gates of hell. The gates of hell are not holding back. But there's another meaning. Gates in the Old Testament were the places where people gathered to take counsel, to make decisions. You know? So if you look at the gates of hell as the councils of hell, where the kings of the earth gather, where they conspire, where they plot things, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. But the enemy has managed to get the church to believe a lot of stuff. That things happen and oh, the enemy is doing this. Well, he's doing that, but what's denying that he's doing those things? But we have a word from our Lord that the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. Amen. I need to begin winding up. Now, just to show you that the disciples were so hung up on the earthly kingdom. <laughs> um, when he appears, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, the, now they are all itching, you know. They have been through a very bad disappointment. Huh? The guy is dead. And then, wow, the guy is alive. He has conquered death. So some thoughts were resurrected. When will we get our cabinet positions? <laughs> so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. He didn't say no. 
It's important to know that he didn't say no. He just says there are certain times and certain seasons. It's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and somewhere at the ends of the earth. So he's saying that will come, the times and seasons have been set by the Father, but meanwhile, you will be my ambassadors. You will go out. We are still in that zone. Now, as I wrap up, I just want to say that God never fails what he set out to do. Things may have taken thousands of years, um, but what he told man, let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air. That will be restored. It's been restored, actually, through Jesus. But now he expects the church to move into that. Amen. That will not end. The earth will be restored. God allowed some prophets to see this. Um, Isaiah was one of them. Habakkuk, they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. For the earth will be filled, will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And now we look at our world to say and say, how will that be? Well, God has said it. We are talking about the counsel of God. This is the counsel of God. He has said it will happen. The earth will be filled, you know. The righteous win. It doesn't matter what the enemy is up to. We need to have that in our minds. And as we face whatever we are facing, that's our mindset. In fact, when you read the Old Testament, a lot of the promises are about the, e the evil, the wicked being removed from the earth. It's not the righteous being removed. We've now we listen to a narrative where the righteous are going to be removed. I'll talk about that tomorrow. That's the dominant narrative in the church today. The righteous will be removed. No, 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 no. It's the wicked who are removed. Even, even Lot, 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 who was removed from the earth? Lot was removed from Sodom and Gomorrah, but who left the earth? It's the wicked. In the days of Noah, who was left? It's the righteous who were left. So why have we changed the narrative? Where is that coming from? Where is that narrative coming from? Too many Christians, are, too many of us, and I, I don't exclude myself because God has had to deal with it in me. Because we have an escape mentality, we are not extending the kingdom. We are waiting to be rescued from heaven. And we've misunderstood the scriptures. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, Habakkuk, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. God has told us this is the season. Uncle Leban emphasized it. We've been praying. Our fathers have been praying for 50 years. They have given their lives to pray. And God has been saying, I'm going to visit the continent. So if some fellow is going to take over and uh, destroy the whole earth, then what, how is God answering our prayer? God is telling us the time has come. The church has to wake up. Amen. Amen. Um, it seems I've disturbed a lot of thoughts here, but that's okay. We need a lot of thought disturbance. Hmm? Isaiah and Micah saw this vision. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house, the kingdom of God, will be established on top of all the other mountains, all the other kingdoms, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it, saying, Many people shall come, saying, Come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord, uh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of God from Jerusalem. I would like to end with two, uh, I think there are two powerful quotes here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that name, Paul Bill Humer. He's uh, one of the ancient men. He died, uh, quite an old man. He wrote quite a bit about prayer. It's a very powerful book I would like every intercessor to read, Destined for the Throne. And he makes a statement. He says, that's the church. And only the church is the key and the explanation, the key to an explanation to history. Therefore, history is only the handmaiden of the church. And the nations of the world are but puppets manipulated by God for the purposes of his church. Amen. Creation has no other aim. History has no other goal. Even the events of the last two years, God is shaking his church. God is getting the church to wake up. The time has come for certain things to happen. The church is like Jonah sleeping at the bottom of the rocky ship. It says, wake up. Revelation chapter 15, when the seventh angel blew, 11 verse 15, his trumpet, there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of the world has become. That is the destiny. 
the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. We don't know exactly when that will happen, but we all, this generation has a part to play. We have our role to play so that the next generation can build on that. Amen. 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 When all is said and done, we will find that history was simply history. God bless you.